Hey there! Welcome to Learning with Math, where you can learn and upskill yourself. In this video, we will go through process variables often used in math balances. If you're new here, make sure to subscribe and enable alerts to keep learning with me. Okay, let's get started. A process is a series of actions or steps taken to achieve a particular goal. A combination of steps is a process. There is a process within each step as well. In chemical or process engineering, each step is known as a process unit wherein a process such as mixing, separating, or a reaction takes place. A process variable, process value, or process parameter is a current measured value of a specific part of a process which is being measured or controlled. If you were to look at a pipe and the contents flowing through a particular point, you can measure temperature, pressure, concentration, and the flow of the contents. If there is a reaction happening within the pipe, you can measure percent conversion. These variables are known as process variables. Let's briefly discuss the temperature variable. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy possessed by substance molecules. This energy can be indirectly measured using a resistance thermometer, thermocouple, pyrometer, or a thermometer. There are different temperature numerical scales that can be used to report measured temperature. These scales are developed by assigning a value to two physical phenomena that are reproducible. For example, assigning 0 to the freezing point of water and 100 to the boiling point of water at one atmosphere. The assigned values specify the whole scale because they also specify the length of a unit temperature interval, known as a degree. The two common scales that are defined using freezing and boiling points of water at one atmosphere are the Celsius or centigrade scale and the Fahrenheit scale. The Kelvin and Rankine scales are defined such that the assigned absolute zero value is zero and the size of the degrees is the same as a Celsius degree for the Kelvin scale or a Fahrenheit degree for the Rankine scale. A temperature expressed in one defined scale can be converted to its equivalent in another scale using a temperature conversion formula. Let's derive two of the four formulas. Temperature conversion formulas are always in the form of a linear equation and require two temperatures from each scale under the same conditions. Suppose we need a temperature conversion formula to express Kelvin and Rankine. We'll need the freezing points of a fluid, this case water, and the boiling points. We set up the linear equation and substitute the freezing points into the equation. Since that does not give us any of the constants, we have to move on and substitute the boiling points into the equation as well. If we subtract T2 from T1, we can calculate the constant A, which is commonly known as a slope or the gradient. Since constant B is zero, our formula reduces to this when we replace A in the linear equation. If you wanted to find the formula to convert the temperature expressed in centigrade to its equivalent in Fahrenheit, you'd need to follow the same procedure of solving simultaneous equations. You have your two temperature points from both scales, substitute the freezing point temperatures into the linear equation to solve for constant B, substitute the boiling point temperatures and constant B into the linear equation to solve for constant A, substituting constants A and B into the linear equation gives us the temperature conversion formula we needed. These are the four temperature conversion formulas you can use to move from centigrade to Fahrenheit, centigrade to Kelvin, Kelvin to Rankine, and Fahrenheit to Rankine, or vice versa. I'd like to draw your attention to the temperature intervals because you cannot use these conversion formulas to convert temperature intervals, unfortunately. Let's go. If the temperature changes from 0 to 50 degrees centigrade, that is the same as temperature changing from 32 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Use the temperature conversion formulas to convince yourself of this. The change in temperature using the centigrade scale is 50 degrees and 90 degrees using the Fahrenheit scale. These changes in temperature are the same, so they can be equated. If we divide throughout by 50, we get 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 1 degree centigrade. 
This is the conversion factor you should use for temperature intervals. I'll leave it up to you to find the rest of the conversion factors for all the temperature scales. Let's move on to pressure. Pressure is a ratio of force to the area on which the force acts. The commonly used unit for pressure in SI units is Pascal. We're going to go through the definitions of fluid pressure, hydrostatic pressure, head of fluid, atmospheric, absolute and gauge pressures, starting with fluid pressure. Given a tank containing water and a pipe with water flowing through it, if each had an opening, then the fluid pressure would be defined as force over area, where force is the minimum force that would have to be exerted on a frictionless plug in the hole to keep the fluid from emerging from that area. In simple terms, for this force to contain the fluid, it has to be equal to the force of the fluid in magnitude, but in the opposite or countering direction. Now, suppose there was no hole in the tank. Looking at the base of the tank, we know that the fluid in the tank is applying pressure on this tank and it is anchored there by gravity. This pressure is the hydrostatic pressure. This fluid that's applying all of this pressure has a certain density, height and is acting on the area of the tank space. Similar to fluid pressure, hydrostatic pressure is equal to force over area. This time, the force is defined as the mass of the fluid multiplied by the gravitational acceleration. We also know that the area is the same as volume divided by height. Substituting force and area into the original equation, and considering that volume is the same as mass divided by density, we get rho gh, where rho is the density of the fluid, g is gravitational acceleration, and h is the height or the head of the fluid. These units result in the pressure unit known as Pascal. To get the total pressure acting on the base of this tank, we must also consider pressure on top of the surface of the fluid. Thus, the total pressure is equal to pressure from the top of the surface plus the pressure of the fluid known as hydrostatic pressure. If the pressure at the top was equal to zero, we could express pressure only using the height of fluid. Head of fluid can be used to correspond to pressure exerted by the fluid. Therefore, it's also possible to speak of a head of 33.9 feet of water or 760 millimeters of mercury when discussing pressure. When given the height or head of fluid, you can convert this to pressure once the density of the fluid is known or use a known head of fluid to convert to an equivalent pressure. Let's move on to defining absolute, gauge and atmospheric pressures. The absolute pressure is equal to gauge pressure plus atmospheric pressure. Absolute pressure is actually fluid pressure. If there is no fluid at all, then there is a perfect vacuum, just like in space. Gauge pressure is relative to atmospheric pressure. It tells us how much higher or lower the fluid pressure is from atmospheric pressure. If gauge pressure is zero, then there is no difference between fluid pressure and atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is defined as pressure at the base of a column of air located at the point of measurement, which is at sea level. To visually explain this equation, let's use arbitrary scales. If you have an absolute pressure of a certain value, and the atmospheric pressure, which is constant per region, is below that absolute pressure, then the difference in pressures is the gauge pressure. If we have an absolute pressure below the atmospheric pressure, the difference in pressures is still known as gauge pressure, only it is negative. The next section focuses on the measurement of gauge pressure. There are a few common ways to measure pressure. Pressure can be measured using a Bordon gauge, which is a hollow tube closed at one end and bent into a C configuration, which measures pressure in the range from nearly a perfect vacuum to 7,000 atmospheres, or a barometer which measures atmospheric pressure, or a manometer which measures gauge pressure below three atmospheres more accurately than the Bordon gauge. 
A manometer is a U-shaped tube that is partially filled with a fluid of known density, the manometer fluid. If we have fluid passing over the manometer and the pressure of the fluid is higher than the atmospheric pressure at the other end of the manometer, the manometer fluid level will drop on the high pressure side and rise on the low pressure side. Because the absolute pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure in this open end manometer, the measurement recorded will be a positive gauge pressure. If the manometer fluid looked like this, then the gauge pressure would be negative. The sealed end manometer is similar to the open end manometer, only it is not exposed to the atmosphere. The small area above the manometer fluid on the sealed end has no fluid, so it is an almost perfect vacuum. We cannot safely say that it is a perfect vacuum because some manometer fluid might evaporate into or condense from that space. With no pressure on the other end, the recorded gauge pressure is equal to the absolute pressure. The differential manometer measures the pressure difference of two separate fluids. In this case, because the first pressure is stronger than the second, we get a positive value for pressure difference. Labeling the manometer will help us to derive the general manometer equation. We have the U-shaped manometer with pressures coming from both ends and the manometer fluid. It is not only pressures 1 and 2 that must be considered, there is also the hydrostatic pressure from fluids 1 and 2 that make up the absolute pressure. Each fluid has its own height or head. The pressure at point A is the same as the pressure at point B and below. Therefore, the lowest level of the manometer fluid is not considered in pressure difference calculations because the pressure in both arms of the manometer is the same below this level. By ignoring the section below, we can derive the general manometer equation by finding the pressure in one arm and equating it to that of the other arm. Starting with the P1 side, we know that the fluid pressure is equal to pressure from the top and the hydrostatic pressure of fluid 1. On the P2 side, there is pressure from the top, hydrostatic pressures of fluid 1 and the manometer fluid. To move from the general equation to the differential equation, we assume that the measured fluids are the same fluid, meaning that density is the same. So, the pressure difference is essentially the difference in densities between the measured fluid and the manometer fluid. If the measured fluid is a gas, the density is not as significant, so we can ignore it and have the pressure difference be equal to the hydrostatic pressure of the manometer fluid. Remember that pressure can be given as a head of fluid. So for gases, the formula can be reduced to the pressure difference being equal to the head of manometer fluid. I think I will have to do a separate tutorial for pressure conversions. Let me know if you'd like that in the comments. For now, let's move on to the last process variable that we'll discuss in this video called concentration. Concentration is the amount of a substance in a confined space. Suppose we made juice by diluting a juice concentrate in water. The juice mixture or solution will have juice concentrate components and water components. The concentration of the solute or the juice concentrate molecules can be measured in various ways. We can either calculate the number of moles of solute and divide by the liters of solution. This is called molarity. Or we can calculate the number of moles of solute and divide by the mass of solvent, where solvent is water in this case, to find molality. We can even calculate the number of moles of solute and divide by the volume of solvent to find the mass concentration. Please do not confuse mass concentration with density. They have the same units, but density has volume of solute in the denominator. If the number of molecules is too small, we can report concentration in parts per million or parts per billion. If we were to remove the million and billion, this gives us a mass fraction. Some people refer to mass fractions as concentration, but I like to call mass fractions and more fractions compositions. They directly tell us what a mixture is composed of and all the components add up to a fraction of 1 or 100%. A mass fraction is usually denoted with an x, and a mole fraction is denoted with a y. 
Some engineers denote mass fractions with a W and more fractions with an X. Whatever naming convention you choose, just remember to stay consistent so you don't confuse yourself. You can move from a mass fraction to a more fraction by using a table like this one. Say you are given the mass fractions of a mixture made up of components A and B. You can assume a basis, I like to use 100 because the mass of each component is easily calculated from the fractions. Then find the molar mass of each component to find the moles. Remember that mass over molar mass yields moles. So you can say 25 divided by 18 gives 1.389 moles and 75 divided by 28 gives 2.678 moles. Adding the moles together gives the total number of moles of the mixture. From this, you can find the mole fraction by dividing the moles of each component over the total number of moles. The total fraction should always add up to 1. Okay, this brings us to the end of process variables part 1. Let's recap. A process variable is the current measured value of a specific part of a process which is being monitored or controlled. Beware of the difference in absolute temperature and temperature intervals. When there is a change in temperature, do not use the linear equations to convert between temperature scales. Pressure is measured in various ways. Remember that the height of fluid is also a measure of pressure. Concentration, like pressure, is defined in different ways as well. If you know what each means, using concentration to solve for mass balances will go a lot smoother. Trust me. In the very first video, which should pop up on your screen, we discuss some of the concepts that you must familiarize yourself with to perform mass balances in seven steps. We started off with unit conversions. And now we have completed a portion of process variables. In the next process variables video, we'll go through flow, which will be a nice introduction to mass balances. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment and subscribe. Remember that sharing is caring. This video might help someone. See you next time. Bye.